We are live. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever kind of time of day it is for you, uh, wherever you may be in the world, welcome back to Food for Thought Live. Thank you so much for joining us again at a brand new time. What an exciting day this is because it's a, a brand new time. And I'll tell you what else I was excited about this, this last few days was the announcement that gyms are going to be reopening two weeks from yesterday in the UK, that is. Um, and not because of that specifically, but but thankfully that's happening as well because I found this today in the shops. I wanted to share this with you. This 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 episode is not sponsored by anyone, including Ogs. This and this, Ogs. This is a this is a vegan chocolate fudge cupcake, and this is a vegan zesty lemon cake. And I'm telling you right now, I have a real problem now. And thank God the gyms are reopening. Um, I happen to know the people that run that uh, company and they're wonderful people as well. But their cakes are off the chart. So if you're looking for a vegan cake, you want to show off to someone or just serve it to someone who's not vegan, who doesn't think that a vegan cake can possibly be delicious, stuff one of those in their mouth and uh, you'll have a friend forever and you'll have a convert, guaranteed. Staggering. And I mean, it, it's not, this episode isn't sponsored by Oggs. And you'll find them in Sainsbury's and Waitrose, by the way. I just bought it in Waitrose. Um, it's delicious. So there you go. There's a plug for a, a vegan cake. And uh, do work it, work it off if you do take my advice and eat it. So we are back with another Food for Thought Live episode. Um, it's in the 20s. I can't be sure whether it's 22, something like that. But we've had, well, however many we've had, we've had these incredible, inspirational, wonderful, enlightening guests that we've shared time with who have shared their experiences and their stories and their wonderful journeys into this beautiful endeavor of animal conservation, animal welfare, animal rights, all of the things that we love and talk about. And um, I think I used this phrase when we were talking to one of our guests. I can't remember which one, but I did, I did speak about one of my favorite phrases, which is to surround yourself with people who are on the same mission as you. And my guest tonight is on the same mission as me and the same mission as you guys, which is why you always want her around. And you, 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 I can't wait to introduce you, talk about what she's been doing for so long and so well. It is a huge pleasure to introduce you, Kate Stevenson. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Do you know, I'm really sad that we're not doing this in person because you brought hope at a I time know. when I'm not in the room with that you. Was nasty, that was a nasty <laughs> curveball, wasn't it? <laughs> but I'm not going to open this one. I'm not going to open it. You may notice in, in this particular instance, you can see that that box, Amazing. there's an empty space in, on one side of that box. <laughs> uh, there's nothing I could do about it. The other side will be empty very shortly. And my stomach will be sponsored by Oggs, even if the episode isn't. Um, <laughs> It's delicious. Have you ever tried them? I haven't. No, I haven't. And I'm excited now. We actually live not far from a weight I've got weight in walking distance. Check so it I'm out. Going after this. <laughs> now I nearly wept because I made a mistake, a classic schoolboy error. I, I went to the refrigerated cake section looking for them and they weren't there. And I thought, ah, oh, they're out of stock because everyone's found out how good they are. They're not in the refrigerated section. So we're all right. So you just go to where the baked goods are. <laughs> Is this what you all tuned in for? Now you've given them the secret, they won't. <laughs> so this week's recipe, just eat a cake. Um, Kate Stevenson, it's such a pleasure to have you on. We've known each other for a few years now through all, all of, of course, through animal conservation, animal welfare. I can't actually remember, and I love this, I can't remember where we met exactly because we, we see each other at all the events and the protests and the various things. That wonderful photo you shared earlier on of the... Chris Packham thing we, we were at last year when it rained like billio. All, all <laughs> it really did, didn't it? <laughs> it, really did. it really did. But we, everyone was still there. It was still wonderful. We had we had a great day. In fact, I just I was just heading out when you when you were heading in. I think we saw each other on the way through. We did, and it, it, it kind of made it all the better actually because it it, it was like the elements were there with us. You know, there's yeah. there was a ton of people. There was this you know the, the heavens open this pound of rain and it just it was like you know like drums pounding you know we're here for one <laughs> i loved it <laughs> yeah it was great it was it, you're right it did it added to it and it, it wasn't just wasn't just like friendly rain it was like no. have that rain it was like come on 
see see how much you can take kind of rain. <laughs> and, we, and we took it. We took and we walked all the way to Downing Street, didn't we? And yeah. there were some speeches outside Downing Street, I think. And that bird song. Do you remember yeah, the bird song? The bird song. Oh. Up from everybody's phones, that so they encouraged everyone to do this beforehand. That as soon as you start walking, that you'd play that audio, and yeah. there were like thousands of phones all playing out bird song as we walked. It was like this, you know, other than the rain, these kind of silent streets of London yeah. dashed in out the rain. And Powerful. Then, echoing a bird song it was you know it gives me goosebumps thinking about it it was uh, yeah profound and and moving um protest march that i've ever been on and you know it will stay with me definitely yeah i would agree it's an interesting one because i was when you were t saying about it i was like oh god yeah it gave me goosebumps i remember it well we, we actually have some video from that on in our documentary food for thought documentary and um it's surreal like you said it was a profound experience because it's because of the the, the contrast to what you'd normally expect. We were in a very busy London street, but instead of there being a chant or lots of noise, because the road was closed to, to the traffic on that day, all you could hear was echoing birdsong right outside Downing Street. It was really profound, wasn't it? It was really powerful. It was a great, great idea. They encouraged everyone protesting to, to not chant and not speak, so we yeah. were silent but, off, but for our phones, yeah. I think that's one of the most important things for us, by the way. I don't know if you saw, I went this morning, I got up at four, and went to catch the sunrise in Richmond Park, and it was spectacular. It's absolutely spectacular. It was one of those mornings where you, I, and you, I, I, at least I'm not capable of predicting this based on forecast, but something to do with the dew point average or the dew point where you get missed. Yeah, Richmond Park is. Oh, it was incredible. As soon as I walked in, I was like, oh my God, it was just That's absolutely spectacular. spectacular. Yeah, it's Richmond Park is one of my favorite parts of, of London. It, yeah, it's you, you can't even believe you're in London. One of the photos I got has the telecom, British Telecom Tower in the background, and it was just this strange. It was almost like Nairobi National Park in Kenya, where you got beauty, natural beauty, and then a city right behind it. But the reason I mention it is because that you just reminded me of it when you talked about the the, the profound nature of that bird song playing at the the, the Chris Packham event. Um, I think one of the other reasons that hits us so hard is because it actually does sort of at least on a sensory level, it connects us with nature. And what I was doing out there this morning was connecting with nature and it was so beautiful. And I, I wanted to mention it because I know you, you're a big advocate for that. Guys, get out there, get into nature, even if it's just a one hour walk at some point, just because man, it, mate, I, we need it sometimes, right? As, and, it, and the power of, of that as well, the, the playing the bird song really highlighted the absence of bird song. You know, it's like that was yeah. artificial in, in the sense that it was coming from our phone. Yeah. You know, it made you realize, like, what would the world be like if this was what we were hearing? Because that is what we should be hearing. We shouldn't be yeah. hearing, you know, the rumble of traffic and, you know, all the things that come along with a busy city. We should be hearing this beautiful sound. And it was noticing that sometimes you have to have it to notice what you're missing. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's a very good point. And it, and it really did do that. Because, like, like I said, you just don't normally hear it and you don't expect it. And when you do hear it, it's quite beautiful. And, and at the same time, quite heartbreaking because of the fact that it's lacking. I remember when I went to Beijing, that's one of those cities where there's, there is nothing. There's no birds, there's no trees, there's nothing. And it's, it's notably absent. You can, you know, it really, you're like, wow, I need some green. I need some countryside. Um, sorry to interrupt myself and you. Just, just wanted to respond to Linda's question. Um, I put the blog on the screen there, Kate on conservation. No, I've put Kate one conservation. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> Let's just redo that. Let's, let's <laughs> Kate one conservation. Cool boy error. Here we go. Look, this is in the sense of one in, in terms of winning. That's great, you know. <laughs> yeah, Kate. Kate one <laughs> conservation. Uh, there we go. That's been corrected. So that's the answer to that question. I'm going to put the question on screen as well because it was a lovely question. Thank you, Linda. Because um, Linda's a, 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 a frequent viewer every week. Linda's here. Thank you, Linda. And uh, that was her question. You can see on screen right now. Let me know where I can find the link to Kate's blog. That's where, kateonconservation.com, which we're going to talk about a lot today because I'd love for you to tell us, Kate, how this all got started for you because you do so much and you've done it for so long. We're going to go back then. We, to, to go, okay. we have to go way back. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm ready. To where it started. So really where it started. I mean, I... I strongly believe that everybody is is born innately interested and connected with nature and animals. 
Um, I do. I've seen, I've got two young children and I see it in them. You know, I've got, a, my, my son is one, my daughter is two. I see it in them. I, I've worked at National Geographic Kids and I've seen these young children, you know, of, of slightly older ages and, and up to sort of teenage years with that passion. I, I think we all start with it. Um, I think what happens is we probably reach a fork in, our, in the road where our life becomes about other things too. And it's that pinnacle moment is when, whether and how you retain that connection rather than where does it start? Where does it stay? Um, right. and, and for me, where it, the sticking point um, was pretty young. I obviously, as you know, we're, we're both very into the Born Free. I'm a, I'm a trustee of Born Free Foundation. <clears> One of my <throat> early memories of being about five or six is my nan, my paternal grandmother, introducing me to the film Born Free. And um, like, that was fantastic. I mean, actually my first thought about Born Free as a child was how funny it was with these lion cubs in house, you know, there's scenes where they're like sort of wrecking the house and, and there's, a, there's a fantastic scene where um, George and Joy, played by Virginia and Bill, um, are carrying these almost adolescent lion cubs out of this house and they've got this big, kind of holding them under the armpits and swaying, carrying these lions out of the house. And I found that hilarious. So to me, the, the first time being a six year old watching Born Free, it was a funny film. And, and But then somehow, as I grew up and understood a bit more, I, I got it. I, this is not that funny, actually. You know, this is this is real things that are happening, and we're we're talking about lions uh, specifically, but animals having a, a right to to have to be in the wild and and to have that. And I think I started to understand that then as a child through that film. And I was a '90s kid, so I I loved the Lion King. So I was watching as I was watching Born Free. I was watching the Lion King. Mm -hmm. and this world I mean I think it's like the first Disney film where it's all animals and no presence of humans I mean, we've got Bambi but there's this horrendous presence of humans with Bambi's mum and the hunter yeah, yeah. Was this showing me a world where animals existed on their own and so it was kind of through these films um so it, it didn't start going out into nature it started watching and then that piqued an interest in what is the nature around me and what's happening um in my own backyard but um, funnily enough, as I was kind of getting into these films, there was a, um, of all things, on the back of Andrex toilet paper, <laughs> I don't know if they still do this, there, there was a coupon um, for where you collected, you cut out this, this coupon and you collected tokens from the back of Andrex toilet paper packets. And um, if you collected like five of these tokens, and sent that, and I think it was about two or three pounds with that in the post um, to the address on the, the packet, you could get a adoption from Born Free Foundation. And I thought, oh, Born Free. I, didn't, I hadn't heard yeah. of it as a charity. I was a child. I thought, oh, this is like the film. This must be something to do with the film. And, you know, I, I saved up and spent my pocket money as a six-year-old on toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> so that I could get... The, the coupons off the back. And and this was literally, like, I mean, it seems strange now that, you know, in this technological Well, actually, world, now everyone's spending the money on toilet paper, but... That's <laughs> true. In this technological world that, you know, I was there cutting and sticking, you know, cutting out this coupon and, and sticking things and literally sellotaping, like, pound coins, which is, again, pocket money for me as a child, sellotaping them onto this thing, popping it in an envelope. And, and walking out to the post the post box at the top of my road as a child to post this thing. And we had to post it on the day that, that I got the last coupon and had saved up the money to, to go. And, and in the post, in return in the post, a week or so later, I got my certificate. And I knew you was going to ask me this question. So my certificate from oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Rocky. Look at that. <laughs> from when oh, I was I like, kept that in such good condition for Oh, I'm I'm like an archive of this stuff. I preserve. Mm -hmm. I'm conservation through and through. <laughs> so I adopted Rocky the tiger, and and Brilliant. as I started hearing the stories in letters from from Born Free and stuff like that, I, that was it. That was my cementing moment. It was this combination of these these childhood films, this curiosity, and what I felt was owning my own tiger. I mean, you tell a a child mm -hmm. nine and ten that you adopted a tiger. To me, I 
owned the tiger. I was a tiger mummy. And I remember going into school and doing show and tell at school and telling everyone that I, I have a tiger. And people were thinking that I've got this thing in my back garden. I mean, now, obviously, I wouldn't allow that myth to continue because I'm right. like, you know, Tiger King and all the rest of it. I don't yeah, have yeah, yeah. <laughs> But as a child and, and with that lesser understanding, it was like, yeah, I'm the, the cool kid with the tiger. <laughs> and then that was, that was right. It was Born Free that ignited that passion for me through and through. Amazing. It's such an honor to still be involved with them so heavily. How did that relationship get to the point that it's at where you're, you're as you say, you're a trustee mm -hmm. of, the, of the Born Free Foundation and actually you were the youngest possibly still are you were the young, ever, youngest ever trustee of the born free foundation when that when yeah, that happened how did that just recently i've been knocked from that title we have the wonderful jess rubin has joined the board and she's fantastic yes. half kenyan which is so valuable she's to have amazing. that voice you know speaking from a background mm. of knowing and understanding kenya on on the board of the yeah board. She's she's knocked me off, you know. I just I just turned thirty, and then that you know that week we had our first born free meeting with me not being the youngest. I thought I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I um, it started you know like I said that that relationship really began with that adoption as as a child, and I off the back of that because I'm impatient and very curious, I'll say, which is something that's served me well in journalism. Um, that curiosity, I wanted to know more. I got my, my certificate about this tiger and my photograph and right. um, my once a year letter from, from Born Free, which is part of the adoption package. Mm. And I wanted to know more. So I actually wrote to, um, to Born Free and said, yeah, I want to know all about this tiger and I want to know about lions because I've seen lions in the Born Free film. And do you still do things with lions? You know, I was interrogating right from the off. <laughs> I, I, love, I bet they love that. Yeah, I bet and they absolutely love, love that. A, like beautiful letter which is i've also kept here I, I got my beautiful letters back as a child about learning about you know tigers and they go tigers and lions these things which was part of the, the born free sort of kids club which i then joined in response to my letters which is called go wild i think it was <laughs> I'm not gonna tell me off if i got that wrong kids go wild i think it was called <laughs> I tried that as a child and um that I, I learned more. I asked. I asked for more, and I, I got more information. And um, I, I really began there, wanting to build this relationship. And I adopted back then um, two lions, um, which were the, the two lions who were on the only two lions on the adoption um, roster then, which is Rafi and Anthea. And I think Anthea was named after Anthea Turner, who had raised money at the time. Um, they were in Kent and um, I grew up in Norfolk and, and I thought oh, one day <laughs> I, one day I will go to Kent <laughs> this big ambition I will go to Kent <laughs> dream see, big right <laughs> <laughs> I, I will see these these lions um in this this sanctuary with these rescued lions and um and and see them in person because it, like I said not forgetting it was lions and the lion king born free yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's interest and um I, as I was following this, following the story and adopting the lions and getting the letters, um, they announced this opening of uh, Shamwari, the rescue center at Shamwari Game Reserve, which I know you know very well with King the Lion. Yeah. Um, and and Rafi and Anthea were the first ones to move out to the rescue center in Shamwari. And so young me, I shall go to Shamwari in Africa, thinking it's basically the same thing, you know? It's Kent, Kent Shamwari, <laughs> same day maybe. Yeah. yeah, so that was, you know, as this child, I, I shall go now, I shall follow these lines, I'll go to, to Shamwari and see them. Mm. And um, obviously that was a much bigger ask than, than I realized. And it remained this strong ambition and I'm, I'm quite a determined person. And I decided when I was doing my A-levels, the start of my A-levels, that, um, my career was probably going in the direction of journalism and writing and I didn't imagine that I could combine that with an interest for wildlife you know back then information was less readily available and mm. and I sort of felt you either go into news and magazines and and that's it in terms of journalism and in terms of wildlife you'd probably be a vet or a zookeeper and neither of those were what I wanted to do. Right, right, so, right. Cool. So that's that's it. You know, this these things are separating now and I shall do this career and I shall 
like wildlife from the sidelines. And I thought now is the time before I go off to university to to go to Shamwari and and see. I mean, by that point, actually, the the two lions, you know, years have passed. Something like twelve years have passed, and and Rafi and Anthea were no longer alive. But I thought I, I still want to go. I still want to see that. I still want to, you know, fulfill that dream. Owe that to my childhood self. Um, and I and I booked it uh, on a whim. And I rang my dad up from <laughs> my college where I was studying A levels, and I said, "I've booked, I've booked this trip. I'm, you know, I'm I was 16 at the time. I said, I'm, when I'm 18, I'm 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 going on my own. I'm I'm going to go out there." And he said, "Well, how, how much? What have you booked?" And I said, "It's, it's going to cost." I hadn't made any payments at this point. There was a payment plan. It's going to cost at that point was five thousand pounds. So my dad was like, "Well, you better work hard." And I did, and and I took cleaning jobs. I cleaned. Um, in a care home for old people, I did retail jobs, I did all the things, I wrote articles for, for you know, money for magazines and things, I did every, absolutely everything under the sun to earn money, you know, whatever, chores and everything else, to earn the money to, to go out in those, in two years time out there, and, and I did, and it was um, weeks after my 18th birthday, I, I got on that plane on my own, and I, and I went to Shamari, and that was the most life-changing experience. Really, you know, knowing like say, knowing Sean Murray like you do, I just nothing compares to just stepping, stepping into that place, seeing these rescued, you know, lions, big cats they've got there, right, right, and you know, and there's something about seeing, you know, this idea that they are back in their ancestral home, which is where they belong. You know, these these right. poor yeah. animals that have been through these ordeals and they've lost their. Yeah. Yeah. you know the connection with that place to see them back there and you connect with it you know i just i remember that i i haven't been back since you know that was um 2008 i haven't right. been back since but i never forget that first arriving at, at the shanghai rescue center and seeing seeing what's going on there and you well, that must have been huge for you though because that had been up to that point such a huge part of your life since you were a kid as you say everything it seems was leading to that moment where you stepped off, stepped into the Shamwari Game Reserve and the, and the Rescue Center, and you're like, "This is." It must have literally been one of those moments where you thought every part of my life has been leading to this moment right now. And so it's connected with so much for me too, because it was my 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 grandma who introduced me to film Walk Free. It was my other grandma who introduced right. me to film The Lion King. It was my mum who, you know, showed me this Andrex toilet paper thing. Look, you right. can. So, you know, it was connecting me with, you know, this this lineage of my own and also this amazing place, which does, you know, if Africa does feel like it goes to your soul. Um, and I, I remember, like I remember the, just the smell, you know, the smell of the air where it smells yeah. like grassy heat, slightly of elephant dung, you know. <laughs> like, Isn't it beautiful? I mean, it's incredible. That sunshine and how vivid the colours are yeah. and knowing that these animals... Yeah. We're going to live the rest of their life there in comfort in this place that mm -hmm. was incredible. In it, safety. It, and and it, it didn't, it never stopped there. I, I feel like every decision and everything that my, happened in my life since then goes back there. You know, I I started my blog um, to, as part of my journalism degree, we had to do right. something about, write about something you care about online and, and try and put these journalistic elements in it. And, and it was about Shamwari. I started my blog as a blog about my days volunteering at Shamwari. And it's now grown to what it is now. Which I'm going to share on screen right now. Yeah. Gosh. And um, that, that's where that began. And, and the choices I've made and the companies I wanted to work for, I've been lucky enough to work for Discovery and Nat Geo. And so much leads back to that time in, in Africa. Um, I, I felt, like I say, before going there, I felt that I was in this fork in the road where it was going to be journalism or wildlife. And being there, I knew I wasn't going to let it go, that I couldn't disentangle these these elements of what's important to me. Um, and I was never going to stop being an activist then. You know, I think, right. once, I think that's when the activist in me was born. Once I saw the life that thing that these animals can have and should have, and I thought, I, I can't turn my back on this now you know every animal has a right to have that opportunity to, to be wild or if not fully wild have have a sanctuary that's as close as right um, and like i said that's that's cha that changed everything it changed the absolute course of my life 
many times and I think every time I come up to the next thing in my life that the decision is informed by the memories and the the feeling of that um wow so not even just the initial launch into the blog but since then even you've you've been you've been sort of swayed in different directions by that experience absolutely um wow. you know, I've, I've written certain content and stuff um that, that connects to that i actually recently typed up all of my Tiamari diaries on a blog series you know it was kind of the end i think it was like 10 years since i'd been there and i thought i'm going to return to my old handwritten travel diary and type this up and i typed that up and you know and and that's kind of helped me think about you know what about travel next i entered off the back of doing that i entered a travel writing competition and then amazingly won from that entry a, a trip to costa rica and peru wow which obviously sadly has been postponed but oh, right, right. It does come around I, you know that's going to be the next thing and that's put, made me put my energy into to thinking about rainforests and and you know connecting with with wildlife in those places too so i think it, it drives a lot of it directly or indirectly um that born free spirit is is there and that spirit of it, everything deserves to have its place um and we are just finding our way home too you know just like those lions down their way home you know oh, that's beautifully put i know i noticed joanne from uh, born free was on earlier and she made a very good point that you you do an incredibly good job of explaining lots of things very, very well. Mm. And that was a good example of it because that's a really big, profound thing you just explained there for you, for you personally. And it's obviously been hugely impactful. And then, of course, the ripple effect, that impact on you has, has translated to huge impact on others. And, I mean, you guys just saw, if I um, put it back up on screen, you guys just saw the sort of the amount of stuff that's here you, this blog, this is this covers an awful lot. I mean, just looking at campaigns, the sorts of the breadth of the issues that you address, that you talk about, that you empower people to get involved in, and educate is one of your. I know the education is a huge thing for you. How, how you've? I mean, you, what? Tell me what's the what are the priorities for you out in, in, in amongst this? Because it's such a huge endeavor. I mean, it's a full time job for you, right? I mean, this is your. This is your yeah. career. Well, it is, and 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 more so the, the blog more so than ever because I sort of um, at the end of last year um, left my I was education editor at Nat Geo Kids, and I left that to go freelance to focus more on this and you know other works that this leads on to. Um, obviously, that's been affected by COVID nineteen. I had a few speaking opportunities to you know. Right. Really now, public engagement is the next stage of sort of my my um, activism and. That right. I, an interest um but i just I, I noticed and i knew that there was a need for sort of a gateway to a lot of that information i mean we can see a lot of stuff being shared online a lot of the time connected to all these individual things that you mentioned mm. you know um captivity captivity or things like canned hunting um what's going on in, in uk with like biodiversity crisis climate change but there's obviously there's a a thorough of information out there that's that's hard to wade through and there weren't many places harnessing everything i mean there was like specialist places you know where you can go and, and read particularly about and hunting and particularly about this but a lot of us in this <clears throat> holistic thing you know it may there might be a gateway that gets you there you know it may be that interest in um wanting to save bees or something that but get you then interested in the wider ecosystem the flowers sure. but I think we all know once we're in this it grows and it expands and you, you can't stop at one because everything is this big interconnected web of, of issues and cons conservation issues that happen around us all the time and um and there wasn't places that were like I say harnessing all of that and giving that information in an accurate way and and that's the other thing as well like accuracy gets lost online I mean I grew up without obviously the internet being that big player that it is now and the information that that i used to get in journalistic ways was was from newspapers you know physically going out and buying a newspaper or not even so much conversations like we have now but now we are all in conversations all the time and all absorbing yeah. that and not all of what we're getting is right and correct for a start and the statistics can easily be misleading or wrong 
and you know there's a lot of shouting out there and I thought I have a journalistic background which is based you know on the print you know I, I've studied ethics of journalism you know I'm big on the principles of journalism you know you can't go and work for somewhere like National Geographic and, and get it wrong mm. um, so you're, you know you're accountable you know I have that sense in my background of accountability that it comes back on me and it comes back on I mean, my name is literally over the door there. It's Kate on conservation. It's not conservation stories or something that, that takes me out of it. Like my name is over the door and I'm accountable. Right. Everything that I put out online, I want to know. And I do know that if anyone's going to come back and challenge it, that I've, I, I've fact checked, that I've proofread, that I've spoken to the right people, that I've got experts in on this, you know, like I, I back it. I back every single word I put out there. And not that's hard to find online right. space in in the wildlife space something that it's fully accurate, and um, that's what I wanted to do. You know, I thought I've got this. This is how you know. As I mentioned, when I had this walk in the road at eighteen, of you know, journalism takes me this way and wildlife takes me this way. How do I bring the two together? You know, somehow they did we meet. You know, those those parallel lines met up, and it's here. It's on that blog, and it's from starting that to reflect on Shamwari that, that grew into what it is now. Um, and that's what it's about. And it's about that education. And that's why I feel confident to go out and speak to young people, speak to children, talk at, I've done a few schools and assemblies and stuff like that. Um, I was involved when I worked at Discovery with Racing Extinction documentary. Um, yeah. I was on the small team that, that turned that documentary into classroom resources. So we sort of edited parts of that documentary to bite-sized nuggets and put it out with um, information for teachers and lesson plans and further resources so it could be used in the classroom. And as part of my role in that, I was going out into schools and engaging with the school, talking in an assembly and running workshops around racing extinction. So I have that kind of background where I feel confident to do that because obviously you're giving a, an assembly on that kind of thing and children challenge something because their children are brilliant for challenging things. Right. Children, ask the questions that adults will not ask right. and they will be the best questions because their minds are just you know full of that and that enthusiasm yeah. and you know I, I have i've always felt like i have to know right i have to know as much as i can to answer those questions and if i don't know i have to have someone in my network that can answer that for me that i can ring right. up and say hey what is this right so accuracy was a big thing putting accurate stuff and and i've just actually written and it's not gone out yet it's going to go out tomorrow morning the mammoth piece about what's happening in the uk right now really? covering everything from hs2 um to the biodiversity crisis to the climate change summit that the uk is hosting next year this green economy and new green deal and, and bringing all together so many things because i get i was thinking there are a lot of voices and spatterings that people might not know are all tied yeah. to the Bread. Um, so that's what I've been doing, you know, and I, I have my head in so many facts all the time, but I love it. I live for it. <laughs> and so just on that point that you just made, whoops, not that one. Let me do this one. On that point, where when you say you'll post that tomorrow, where will that be in the blog bit? Blog, yeah. So in the, the top, um, right. Maybe on the top left there, um, right. under blog, there's the, you know, all of my latest posts come up there. But the idea is you can navigate any one of those things. You want to know about an animal, you can look on the animal section and pick that animal and, and read about it. You want to look at, you know, wildlife heroes. There's interviews with lots of different people. I've tried to do it so that you can cut that um, for this kind of taxon taxonomy of what is it I need to know? You know, it can be a reference. What is it I need to know and how to find it? It's a brilliant idea. Absolutely brilliant idea. So you guys watching, when, you, when you're when you following the blog from now on, um, what Kate's referring to is that collective piece that she's written about the UK will be right there in the blog section. So check that out for sure. What an incredible gift you are to this movement, because as you say, there's a lack of, well, not a lack of accuracy, but there's a, there's a plethora of inaccurate information in amongst the accurate. And uh, what I think is so, so powerful about what you've created here, again, for you guys watching and for me and everybody else, we the whole idea of this series is to find people who inspire and empower and that key word being empower in this particular instance the the power you have when you have the facts 
which is, of course, what you're referring to, Kate. You know, the whole reason why you know that you need to have fact-checked and proofread everything is because of the the power of that position, but also the the the, the lack of power you have if you're if you are wrong, you immediately lose all credibility. I know, you know, I've had this conversation with Will from Born Free. You know, you've got to get it right when you put something out there. You've got one. It only takes one incorrect fact for people to discredit everything you say. So for you guys watching, this is an incredible resource for you, for all of us, where, and Kate, it's brilliant the way you've laid this out in terms of country, in terms of animal, in terms of people. It's, you know, the, it's, it's a, you, you guys can see and have a navigate around. It's fantastic. I mean, look at this. It's just how far, how deep do you want to go kind of thing? Wonderful. I mean, I, I think that the other thing about inaccuracy is it's dangerous. It, it hurts not only like the movements of the people yeah. who are campaigning and like say you and I, you know, we get out there and, and kind of wave up placards and, and speak and try and be, as I said, a, the voice of the voiceless. You know, as we try and do that, it, it, it's dangerous to get that wrong because that can spread so easily. Sure. You know, you can tell one person thing accurate and they'll tell the next person, they'll tell the next person. And we lose sight of, of what's right. going on. Sometimes that means we can water down some of these things. And I know, you know, from experience that there are bad trades that happen out there off the back of misinformation. Sure. And of course, things like the can hunting industry is, is one of those. And that's something actually that, that inspires me not because I I made those mistakes. You know, when I was 18, I went out to South Africa. You know, I was doing all this amazing stuff, volunteering with Born Free and Tomari. And then independently of that, I'd, I'd booked a few things to go and do while I was out there on this once in a lifetime trip. and um, one of those was um, walking with lions and, and petting lion cubs, and you know, I I did that, and and yeah. it's one of those things that haunts me, you know, yeah. it haunts me to think about what that means, what that entails. But in in two thousand and eight, we we didn't even have smartphones, right. you know, Facebook was a completely different beast. I mean, I remember as a teenager using Facebook, we were just, you know, poke your friends and and <laughs> yeah. it was it wasn't Probably cheap at them, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't what it is now. And that information was not readily available. Mm. And the information that I was trading off of, even as someone who right back then was, was, you know, had studied media studies for A-levels and starting a journalism degree, even then um, as someone who was would read around and do their research, all the research that was coming up was that this, you know, was helpful, that these were these poor orphaned cubs and, and this is, you know, good for them to, to be raised in this way, to be hand raised and to, that they would be released in the wild. And obviously since then, I, I know that's absolutely not true. It's the polar opposite. And it's one of the worst and most damaging industries for for conservation and animal welfare. Um, and, and that's, I think, another reason why I'm inspired to try and fight against that misinformation because animals suffer for it. Um, you know, anim animals do suffer. And Hopefully. It's, it's hard when you know that you played a part in that, but that's also a driving force and that's, it's not okay. Like, I, I don't believe in this thing that it's okay to have an advocate animal. You know, I, I don't believe that, you know, as an, every animal as an individual has its right to the best life that it can have. And yeah. it's not good enough to me to say, well, it's okay that, you know, Cecil was a, an advocate and it was worth mm -hmm. losing him. It's not worth losing any animal. No animal should mm -hmm. suffer. Um, and so because I'm, against, I, I'm I'm vehemently against letting one thing suffer to learn, I think you know, we need to learn right. before anything suffers. Beautifully put. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, th I see what happens in a lot of instances is where people um, people try to make the best of a bad situation. And they, as you say, they kind of look at Cecil the Lion as, a, as an advocate, as an ambassador for the cause. But as you say, and actually you, you guys have probably seen that the – the dentist who killed Cecil is out. He's on the front pages of the paper again, thanks to Eduardo Gonzalez at the campaign to ban trophy hunting. He's out again, killing animals. I mean, he's not. It, it didn't change a thing for him. So, Cecil may be an ambassador for the, for, as a, or or whatever we, or whatever people term him as. It hasn't done anything, and we need to stop that suffering before it starts. You're absolutely right. And interestingly enough, on the fact thing, talking about Eduardo, you guys will have <laughs> you, you you probably remember very well that that was the the episode where we got trolled by hunters and their entire mo their entire approach to to trying to troll us to attack us was fact checking the, that's all they did you know they didn't even get insulting they just said you're wrong about that you're wrong about that 
this is the actual fact. This is the, and of course the power and, and Eduardo's facts aren't incorrect, but the point is you have to be able to go back to it and say, actually you're incorrect. Here are the, here are the independent reports from where I've derived that information. And they can't argue with that. You're absolutely right. The power of it is immense. And and that's the attack. I mean, I've been, of course, I've been trolled. I, I speak on the side of, you know, animals and against, you know, any of us who are out there being activists or advocates are, are going right. to get it. It's, it's part, part and parcel. And so that's how I do it too, is being able to say, well, that's not true. I mean, I remember the, the protest that we were talking about at the beginning of this chat, the People's Walk for Wildlife. Um, you know, there was a, a tweet posted that I retweeted from someone who was there, this image, and uh, someone who was against that, um, you know, that was on, on this side of, well, you know, we must shoot grouse for whatever reason that doesn't stand up. And um, they, they, they said, oh, there was only, you know, people were saying that this was such a big protest, there was only 100 people there. I said, that's absolutely not true, but they were saying it as it was, you know, and, and they, they posted this picture of this yeah. very small area of, you know, the crowd, you know, not the, the wide angle shot of the whole crowd, but this this sort of cherry picked area yeah. of the crowd and, and a number of people as if that was everyone. And other mm -hmm. people were seeing that and sharing it, sharing it as if it was fact. And it was like being able to then, you Same. know, answer that with a photograph of actually, here's the full wide angle shot. Yeah. Pick this number. and and then it it, it silenced you know, one of the only ways that you can kind of silence that and yeah. and actually they've deleted the, the tweet after that because more people were then seeing this bigger image and sharing that sharing that and and that's yeah. sometimes the only way is I, I don't get involved in these sort of throw mud at each other things i think a lot mm. of a lot of things come from misunderstandings and represent misrepresentations and there aren't actually you know, oh, I like to believe there aren't actually that many people who, who are doing things for the wrong reasons. They're doing it with the wrong um, information and the wrong yeah. um, environment around them that, that breeds yeah. that information. And sometimes having that re-education with someone and listening to each other and, and being able to answer with strength is a powerful way, not just to shut people down. I, I don't I don't believe in this kind of council, council culture of just shut everyone down. I, I want to re-educate. And, and that's a strong way of doing it. Um, well, we're quite right, because ultimately, as much as we would, you know, I think we, we find the sorts of people who, who argue for, for example, trophy hunting, we find them quite deplorable and quite difficult to have a conversation with. However, nothing's ever going to change in the long term without having a conversation. And that's actually how we can make the, 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 the biggest, most significant impact, and we can make the longest and most effective change is by actually engaging with these folks and you you've got to so you've got to talk to them i mean the trouble is i think that it's it's filtering out those folks who actually do want a conversation because they're quite few and far between as you'll have discovered most people especially if they're trolling a, a you know an, an episode on banned trophy hunting they're not there to be educated they're there to fight they just want to have a they just want to have an argument and they don't want to be taught something that they didn't know they're not they're not receptive to that so you've got to pick your battles, I think, haven't you? Yeah, but, and many of that, though, comes from, you know, an upbringing and, and, a, and a society that they're in that does allow for that. You know, again, it's like, uh, I don't, as I said earlier as well, I don't think people are born with this innate desire to kill things. I think they're born with an innate curiosity. And it's when they reach that point of, like, does this stay or does this go, when it's they're kind of almost groomed with misinformation to go that way that you know that these these counter arguments you hear that it's it's some kind of godly right to go and kill a lion or you know that this is good for conservation and and people almost you know they hear these things over and over and over again and it, and it becomes embedded in them um but if you maybe if you can get them early i mean that before that gets if you can get yeah. them, that's kind of what i felt is is a big part of working with National Geographic kids or discovery and education and going out into these assemblies is, you know, yes, it's hard to argue with adults over Facebook who don't want to hear it, but to educate children and, and for them to take, children have much stronger voices than we give credit for and they can take things home and, and tell their parents things. And we've get, you know, I used to open the post sometimes with um, my role at Nat Geo, I run the Junior Explorers Club which is like opening the post. It was one of my favorite things to do and read the letters from the children and see the drawings stuff. And, you know, and, and they would write things and, and their, their parents would add notes on or clarify or whatever. And, and these parents were having their minds changed by children. 
So giving children that empowerment to, to have the right information to learn and to bring that to their parents, and even if their parents don't listen, that they can bring that with them into adulthood. You know, catching people early is, is I think, a valuable tool in this um, thing that we're doing as, as activists and conservationists. It really is, and we've it's, it's a subject we've talked about a few times, and especially in the in the more recent episodes, we've talked about education a lot. Um, and I know you have this the education se section here. Yeah. Just while we're on it, what can how can how can people engage with that, and what can they, for example, if someone has kids that they'd like to give some some of this information to, or if they they have a contact at a school or something they can perhaps do to help with this this educational stuff. Well, I've, I've put a few initial sort of lesson plans on there and they're sort of um, categorized and they're like key stage two lesson plans, key stage three and four. So that's kind of the age group of the children. Um, it's right. something I'm really going to grow. That's that's the next goal for me um, now is, is to grow that and using my background as education editor for Nat Geo um, to, to grow that into something where there's more and more and more and, and work out what that's going to be and how to engage. Um, I actually, so I'm based in Norwich and I was actually going to be involved in the Norwich Science Festival this year in doing a workshop and talking to the children and building a children's magazine, you know, where, where kids sort of like teaching them to, to write journalism and research and how to tell a story. And um, I was going to create a magazine with them. Unfortunately, again, COVID has pushed that back a year, but that's something I want to do as well is kind of engage children with not just reading, but um, writing their own stuff and researching for themselves and, and understanding the difference between, you know, good sources and bad sources and credible sources and internet rumors <laughs> or junk. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's coming. But for now it's kind of got lesson plans on there. It's got resources that are for all ages to just remind us what these terms are. I find a big thing that I find actually in um, conversations and information out there about anything from climate change to to animal issues is people don't define terms very well you know we have all these this jargon these things like cant hunting which as you and I would know is um, killing lions in an enclosed space which is known as the can you know the, the can is the enclosed space where they, they can't get away even if they try and run there is a ultimately a fence around it well, there's nowhere to go it's an unfair advantage for the hunter of course and you know but i see a lot of stuff where that's written online and and, and there's no you know breakdown of what that is and right. you know people talk about even things that we take for granted that we say greenhouse gases carbon emissions um you know these words that what does that mean climate change what does that mean global warming i mean are we using this term we're we using climate change are they different are they the same and, and so one of those things that I've put there, which is um, resources for all ages, is, is a gateway to kind of have a bit of information of reminding yourself what those things are. And I want to do quite a bit more of that. And that's something I try and do in my writing when I when I write a piece is I try and bracket out if I think mm, do people need this. And I never take for granted that people know what you're talking about. You know, that's one of the rules of journalism. <laughs> never take for granted that they're going to understand you. So make it as simple as possible. Talk to someone as if they don't know anything. And that's, you don't do that in a patronizing way. You do that in a welcoming way because sometimes it can isolate. People open up something and they're trying to read this thing online, but they don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. And you just click away, you know, you don't understand it. And it's a lot to expect people to jump off of that page they're reading to go to Google and, and search these terms. We're not really, we're all in this hurry. You know, we have these cool. attention spans nowadays because everything is there in front of us. And, and that's one of the things that I kind of want to do in, in this education element of what I'm doing is keeping that open and keeping that not embarrassing. I mean, there are things that I, I read and I write that I've been around doing this for a long time. And I think, well, I don't know what that means. Um, and, and I know how to get to the information that tells me what that means in, in an accurate way. I know what sources to use. Let me just kind of feed that to people <laughs> and let them know what that means. Um, well, this is an incredibly valuable tool for everybody. I know I'm, I know I use it and I know that you guys, are, I, I've seen some lovely comments coming through. I wanted to share, but I don't want to lose sight of one particular comment that I want to share and move on to as a next topic of conversation. But, um, I can see people saying like Darren has said that he's going to make it his homepage, that, that your Kate on conservation is going to be his homepage. It should be our go-to place because as you can hear what Kate puts into this, 
is incredibly valuable. It's, it's, it's immeasurably valuable. And, and as we, we've heard, it directly affects animals positively if people understand the facts and it impacts them negatively if they don't. So this is an incredibly valuable tool. And, and what I personally feel off the back of this conversation, and I, and I think we should all take the same action from this, this conversation is, is to try to help you spread your message. Because I know for a fact you could, anybody, any time, any of us, and we do a lot, I know we all do find ourselves in a situation where someone's, someone's confronting us or challenging what we're saying or taking a, the, op the, the, the opposite position on a, on a particular issue. This is exactly the kind of place where you can safely come and say, well, actually, here are the facts. Give that a read and let's, let's have a conversation. And of course, you've still got that filter to apply in terms of does the person even want to have a conversation? Do they even want their mind changing? Are they open to that kind of information? But you can rest assured that what Kate puts out there is accurate and incredibly valuable stuff. So how can we help you get this out in, in less? So that's an informal way of doing it. You know, on an ad hoc basis, anytime someone gives me some grief, I'm going to go straight to the Kate on Conservation blog and say, well, actually, me. I, I'll take the rap, you know. <laughs> I'll put them your. I'll send them your way. <laughs> but see, well, the thing is, this is what this is what I mean. I think you're so brilliant. You're so brilliantly articulate in the written word and in and in person. I feel like we should all be trying to do something to put you on a, a platform as often as possible because you, you you're an incredibly powerful advocate. Well, first of all, I'm I'm always like I think like the door is always open. I'm always willing to to get messages from people asking questions. You know, like. I will take if people don't want to put something out on a comment because it might be embarrassing to. I mean, I had someone ask, I, you know, because I talk on these things. People will ask, well, "What is what is HS two?" And and you know, why why would you necessarily know that? You know, it, it's high speed rail link. It's a high speed rail link between London and the north. Right. Um, that's being built right now and and decimating, you know, ancient woodlands in its path and 130 wildlife sites and all these these things. But if you want to know that, all you're reading is HS2, HS2, HS2. And you know, I'm always well, I always welcome anyone to come and ask me a question, send me an email. There is contact things you if you have me on Facebook, whatever. I I am so willing to to explain these things in a way where it's between us. And you know, I we are all the same team and we back each other and we take care of each other. And you know, for a start, if, if there's anything you'd like to know, so you're always welcome to search my website if you want to get that direct information send me a question, um, feel free to do that. Um, but really, yeah, just share, share, share the, the stuff that's on there, share the blog posts, um, you know. I'm, gonna, I'm just been looking, I've just been put, put tapping in the um, Facebook page, which is right there, guys. So there's, what, I mean, what an incredible offer, what an incredible thing you just said that you're, you're op your door is open, you, you're willing to talk to people and help them to understand issues to fight their corner essentially in terms of the information you can provide. And, what an incredible offer. I've learned this from doing the stuff I do for children. I mean, I didn't start out thinking that education would come into what I'm doing. It was going to be, let's say, news journalism, hopefully right. with environmental spin on it. But um, opportunities came my way. I started, I got a job as a sub editor. So again, that fact checking and that sub editing, proofreading verifying people the spelling of people's names and things like that which goes missing so easily on facebook and then you know so you read a post and it says someone's name and you put that name into google and you can't find them it's because their name is you know like that kind of information it, it can disarm right. you when you are right. you know trying to learn those things and and so starting as the sub to kind of taught me that and being a sub for the children's media is where i really learned like if you can talk to children you know, and, and get children to understand. You can talk to adults and get adults to understand. And it's, it's absolutely the same principle. And that is not a patronizing thing. Not that sure. is, that, like I say, children will ask the questions that, that adults won't. And, you know, and I, I, I have an example of this where I went, um, as part of what I was doing for Nat Geo, I was talking to an astronaut. Um, I went to this lunch with an astronaut, which was an incredible experience. And um, it was with a, a, a group of school children. And right. I was sort of asking, my questions and adults asking and the things the kids were asking were yeah. so intelligent and and i learned so much more from the answers that the the astronaut was giving these kids than what i learned from even my own questions that i, I came right back and i said i've got to think like a child you know i've got to imagine that i've got a clean slate on this 
you know, what do I want to know if I don't bring into the what I already know, which is NASA means this, and and you know, the, there was a space shuttle at this time, and now it's the Soyuz, and all these things that I take for granted that I know, because I maybe don't know it as well as I think I know it. And so imagine I know nothing, and imagine you know I'm I'm talking to people who know nothing once I have learned that, and, and that's, it, that's a, a brilliant principle to live by. And like, so you don't have to patronize people if you just explain in your writing you know i i had this um thing where i, I saw this destruction being caused by hs2 brackets the high speed rail link that doesn't upset anyone and that's not insulting to anyone of course not yeah um, and so talking uh, talking with children and i've learned so much from from young people in so many ways and i've been inspired right. and motivated in so many ways and i bring that that kind of think like a child and and imagine see like a child imagine that you know that whole thing if you're stepping out to this nature reserve for the first time, see it in those finished child, child eyes. You know, if you're experiencing a seeing a maybe an endangered insect or something, you know, see it for the first time. Even if you've seen a thousand times a picture of a um, a badger on television, go into the badger watch and and go and see a badger for the first time and see it for the first time. Forget everything you know and see. All the things that you don't know, um, and that's a, that will give energy and motivation and, and enthusiasm in leaps and bounds. Um, you know, so again, I hope I, I channel that through my blog too. But I try, <laughs> I try to keep that I energy. Think, I think it's fair to say you do. I mean, it's it's really um, you, what you're the way you're articulating it now. I, I, you know, it's the first time I've heard you talk about it in the way that you're talking about it. Of course, obviously, I'm, you'll, you'll have spoken about it before, but it's the first time I've had the pleasure of hearing it. And it's just so wonderful because what I wanted to do was to be able to impart to people, this is why you need to read this blog. This is why it's so wonderful. And Kate's doing such a fab, fabulous job of, of expressing that. You know, you, I mean, the thing is, you do it with such, such expertise and such beautifully articulate but so so much humility as well where it's just this childlike awe and wonder and and a desire to make make things better and that's what that's what comes across i mean the whole the very the energy of it if you're anyone who's into energy and i know a lot of you are the energy of it's beautiful and i think that's incredibly conducive to a constructive conversation with with the people who, who have the opposing view it's it, it's like the, it's like louis theroux it's like it's literally like the Louis Theroux effect, where Louis Theroux can can go into a a room full of neo Nazis and say, "But why don't you like people who are Jewish?" And he doesn't come across as confrontational. He just that was a terrible Louis Theroux impression, but you get me. He he he, um, he seems in a childlike way to be able to just ask a question very innocently and get an answer from these people who who would probably tear the head off the, the other the, the the next person to ask the same question. I mean, that's, I, mean, I remember going to a um, fantastic debate and um, we were talking about trophy hunting and um, if anyone has seen the film Trophy, uh, John Hughes, the rhino guy, um, if you've seen it, you'll know what I mean. He's um, a farmer he, of rhinos. He, he farms rhinoceros and um, removes their horns and has stockpiled rhino horn and, and has this um, it totally reductive view that if I just flood the market with my rhino horns, which I sell for absolute fortune and, and grow my riches that way, um, it will help rhino because it means that people won't possibly poach rhino because they'll, they'll buy my stock. But oh, oh, obviously we know, we know time and time again from everything from, from bear bar farms and, and beyond that, you know, yeah. more that that is out there in the market, the bigger the demand is, they find more ways to do things, you know, we, with the bear bar thing you know it started being this medicinal thing it becomes this thing that's we put it in toothpaste we put it here we put it there every, we put it everywhere because you know we've got all this this stock now because we're breeding super breeding and so we'll find more and more ways to, to yeah. flood the market with this and you know we'll find more and more ways to to mystify this thing so that it's well you know that's that's farmed rhinoceros but what you really want is the good stuff from the wild if you think that's good for your backache or whatever it is toothache you've got you know, yeah, then try try the real deal so it will only perpetuate a, a demand and um i went to this debate with with john hume there <laughs> between john and, and will travers born free mm. and um 
the, the way that, I mean, and always you'll know, the way that Will conducts himself is just this absolute grace and dignity that was so absent in the, the rest of the room, the other side, yeah, yeah. that I felt like even, you know, if you went there as a neutral, that energy alone, that composure, that absolute reliance on, on, on facts and that sort of demeanor of, you know, I know what I'm doing and, and it's not driven by, sure. you know, angry, violent passion to get my money. You know, that, that spoke mm. volumes. It spoke as much as the, the facts coming out of his mouth. And, you know, mm. it's louder. And it's something that, that Jane Goodall harnesses so well as well, that like having, and, and Virginia, of course, mm-hmm. having that humility, that grace, that dignity in, in what you say and, and how you say it and what your philosophy is can speak so much you know are we going to listen to um you know a man screaming about let me sell my rhino horns and believe his conservation efforts or are we going to listen to a man who stands who listens to the other side and then counters with well actually i have all this this information that's not the case and i've seen this in in my experience right. that this. and you know and that kind of killed them with kindness philosophy um yeah is, is what we need as well. I mean, I'm, I'm all for the people who are staunch advocates and, and who are out there. You know, I'm, I am I back things like Extinction Rebellion, where it's like, that's a voice. But, but we need a multitude of voices. We need a diversity of voices yeah. and a diversity of ways of saying it. You know, different people receive things in different ways. There is room for all of us. And I'm very much an advocate of everyone on, on this conservation mission has their place and and should have the you know the, the genuine thing not the corporate greed thinly veiled as conservation but the the real conservationists you know that they all have their moment and their place and, and that's another thing i like to do on my blog too is is to amplify those voices it is not just a a place of me talking about myself <laughs> you know it's not you'll know this you you wrote me a, a fantastic blog post, uh, guest post about your experience with gorillas uh, you know i do a lot of that where i share that platform you know i have that platform i share i invite guest posts i mm-hmm. interview people i um you know share i, I link to other people's stuff you know like i i'm not about competition in this because if we're competing with each other we are not getting the job done and mm-hmm. and that's another thing that, that's fantastic about the career i've had in using those brands of discovery and Nat Geo is kind of putting people forward in that space who may not have access. And that's a big thing that I like to do. I like to put people forward to, to use that space that, that I've grown because I don't want it up here on my own, you know, which is um, why I don't often even do this. I mean, you said that you may have heard me talk before, but I mean, up in, this is the first time I've spoken on a live on, a, on a, any kind of video thing. And <laughs> I was going to get up and speak to audience, you know, apart from yeah. assemblies, I was going to go and speak to audiences this year at these events and it didn't happen. So this is a valuable learning experience for me. Um, but the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm not my face out there everywhere is because I don't think it's about my face. <laughs> I'd rather put a picture of a, a lion and a, and a story of someone who's out in the field doing this fantastic thing, you know, radio collaring lions. That, that to me is, is you know, so valuable and so important that I don't want to drown that out with, you know, just myself, you know? Yeah, I get, I, I totally get the, uh, the principle of what you're saying. <clears throat> I think there's no danger of that because of your humility, which is very apparent. But I also think that there's an enormous value to you being out there because of the way you deliver the message. You're a, you know, you're, you, you provide a platform to, to the folks that you talked about. You give, you give that platform to other people to, to spread the message, the, the collective message we have f- for conservation, but you yourself do an incredible job of it. As, as I said before, written and spoken, you do, you do such a good job of it. And I know that the folks watching agree because I'm seeing the lovely comments come through. Um, I'm so for this opportunity, really. I mean, it's what you're doing here with these Food for Thought broadcasts, you know, it's, it's sharing that platform and getting those voices out there. And that is, you know, I've been watching them, you will know I've been watching them and, and sharing them where I can too. And then, valuable that you're doing you know i really appreciate you taking the time to do this because again i understand what goes into an interview that you you don't just you know uh, to get a good interview you don't just arrive blindly and and having never spoken to a person and and wrote them in you know you you get them at ease you do some research you know who they are you know it's not 
easy you know like it, it's it may come across if you're doing a good job it comes across as you know this takes no time at all but you you will know from from doing this and i know from what we do you know we we don't go in blindly it's preparation and it's it's effort and probably like me there's no money and i mean like my blog there's it's not monetized you know um i have been paid what well, was going to be paid for, for speaking uh at speaking events um and there have been, I mean, maybe one or two um, posts that are clearly labeled as working with brands. And, and they were, you know, with that advocate advocacy element. So there was, a, I did a thing about Amarula um, alcohol that was, you know, they were raising money for um, elephants. And, and that yeah. was one of two posts that's been monetized. The rest of what I'm doing is for free. And, you know, I, it's not yeah. paid. It's not, I'm not making a living in, in that way. Um, I have, I have a walking tour business with my husband, which is where we, you know, make a living. Um, it's still part of that thinks is walking, and we're not, you know, we're doing that ethical thing of going out yeah. there and seeing things on foot. Um, but it, the blog isn't, you know, that's another reason why I'm free to to be accurate and and to speak truth right. is because I have all these these things pulling at me to 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 say this and do this and you know, and I think sometimes when you obviously. Put yourself out there in this this way where people own you because they're paying you you can't speak but it means that when you you are doing that work you're doing it for free and Absolutely. and i know that you know that's the value is is that you're not getting a monetary value but you're getting this what voice out there and this word out there yeah yeah absolutely doing this this same thing of, of sharing these messages and sharing this voice not for cold hard cash and that's i think like i say where we, we stand different to these people who clearly are you know these these i sell rhino horn and i you know farm this and do this that you know we, yeah. we can speak in that more pure way you know and even sort of as a trustee of born free the, the trustees as trustees don't get paid you know no, of course. Yeah. For, for, for the right reasons and but that doesn't mean it's any less hard work and it doesn't mean it's any less the amount of time and effort and energy that goes into paid work for sure. BBC or anything else. Um, and so giving that, it speaks volumes as well. And like I say, I, I'm so appreciative of, of you doing what you're doing here and, oh. and those voices. So, you know. Well, like, you know, like you, I mean, it's, this is a, this is a, uh, this is something that I do just out, out of my own passion for it. And of course, there's, there's no money in it because who, who's, who's going to pay me? I mean, I pay myself. But, 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 um, with, cake. <laughs> with cake. Exactly. Um, but, but, I mean, you know, it's absolutely fair enough for people to get money but for it. And I um, well, if it's a, Yeah, if it's a know, full-time job. Yeah, absolutely. Just for, for me, I needed that freedom. Um, sure. And that the authenticity. Mm. Income, like I say, bar a couple of sponsored posts that are clearly labeled as that and, and not sure. tricking anyone. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. And I mean, the thing is, I, I don't think any, well, I know I wouldn't begrudge you if you were able to monetize it and turn it into a, a paying gig because it's so important. But I understand because it's the, it's the way I do all of this as well. I mean, like I say, there isn't, this isn't on a, a platform where I could monetize it. This isn't. This isn't something that I could say, oh, well, I could chuck some ads on it. This just doesn't, I haven't got that opportunity, but I, I'm with you in terms of that. You, you use the word, it's, you can, we can do this from a very pure place. Mm. I can have a conversation with, well, I wouldn't actually find it very easy to have a conversation with John Hume as the example of that, that rhino farmer. Um, I would find it very difficult to have a conversation with him, but I have nothing to gain other than the life of rhinos. Mm. I have nothing to gain and he has millions to gain. So, so actually taking a leaf out of your book, Kate, you know, where Kate doesn't make any assumptions that people know we live in this bubble. Kate, Kate and I both live and breathe this stuff. So um, it's easy for us to assume, and I've learned from Kate not to, that people know who John Hume is. John Hume, as, as Kate says, is not, not just a rhino farmer. He's the, he, he owns more, he's the single biggest independent rhino owner. And he, last count has around 1500 rhino um, in South Africa. And he um, he has been fighting and fighting over the years to legalize the trade in rhino horn. And as Kate said, any any legal trade in in ivory and rhino horn or anything else legitimizes the illegal trade, and it provides a place for illegal ivory or or, or, or rhino horn to be laundered. 
Uh, so it's a huge, and it's, this has been demonstrated over and over again. The reason I'm t saying all this is because just just recently, South Africa has granted him his his wish. He, they've legalized the, the trade in rhino horn. They've now said tr rhino can be treated as livestock, like a farmed animal, and he'll he'll argue until the until you know he, until the end of his life, he will argue that he's he has the recipe for saving the rhino species. And he and I've and I've seen the man speak in person, same as you with the the um, debate that you saw him and Will Travers have. I was at a, I, I hate to say I was at a screening of Trophy, but I went with Will and I went I went out of a sense of duty. Um, I've seen Trophy twice, and I think that was bankrolled by John Hume. I think that he probably I get I, the, the impression I got was that was a a propaganda tool, tried trying to get neutral people on board with the idea that. He's got the recipe for saving the rhino species, but he was he's the most aggressive confrontational man I've ever encountered. Um, and he has literally, literally millions of dollars at stake if he can sell the rhino horn, which he now can. You and I and anyone else who's advocating for the alternative aren't standing to gain anything from that, you know, with a more powerful position. Potentially pollute what I'm doing if I were if I was because then you could have this argument of well she's only saying that because someone's paying it to and no one's paying it to say anything um and and actually I wrote two blog posts you know in, in reference to what you're talking about there if anyone wanted to search them on my blog I wrote about the film trophy and my honest reaction to the first time of watching that and funny enough that that debate that I mentioned with Will Travers is is briefly in it and and there's a very tiny clip of me there you know twiddling this pen you know <laughs> staring this deaf stare at john, <laughs> john. um, <laughs> um you know, i wrote about the film trophy and right. why you know what this, its inaccuracies are and mm -hmm. and why that you know obviously because it's a it's a blog there's i do put my opinion in there it's clearly labeled as my opinion it's not labeled as fact you know it's it's clear as day. I felt this. I saw this. Um, but you know, I've explained, explained that what my reaction is and, and what's going on and why those issues exist in, within that that are purely inaccurate and, like you say, purely propaganda. And right. I also wrote directly about the um, prior to that about the debate I'm talking about. So again, if you were to go on my blog and go under campaigns, you could find trophy hunting rhino horn, um, or just put it in the search. You know, um, rhino debate or something. Yeah. Um, those should come up. And you know that's a good place to start to kind of diving into that world. Yeah, um, yeah very much so. Yeah. Um, now to take a total diversion, because we've we just again as always we we haven't rehearsed or planned anything. We didn't. We didn't <laughs> I, I didn't think there was going to be any, any lack of subject matter for us to want to discuss. Um, I want to share something on screen from Anna. Um, Alafi. Please tell us a little bit about Alafi and what this all entails. And Anna, it's lovely to see you and thank you very much for your kind words. I'm very proud to be an ambassador for you. And I know I know Kate is as well. But Kate, tell us a bit about how this beca became part of what you do. So as I have said, my, my, my door is always open and, and people message me, you know, frequently all the time. I, I'm, you know, always, it might take a few days to reply to because I'm always up to my eyeballs and emails. And one of the people who very kindly got in touch with me was, was Anna who um, messaged me, I think it was early last year. I mean, time led into one over this lockdown period, but <laughs> Anna got in touch and um, last year and, and, and said, I'm starting this first ever um, Animal Welfare Awards in Cyprus and this inaugural Elafi Animal Welfare Awards. And, and I'm looking for people to sort of help me get that off the ground and, and, and get that voice out there with this view that, um, you know, Cyprus has one of the worst animal welfare records, you know, in, in, in Europe. And mm. we need to change that. And, and she, the way that she positioned it is we need people outside to be looking in um, to hold those powers that be accountable and to, to say that, you know, this mm. we're watching, you know, and that's a powerful thing when, when people outside of countries use this kind of stance of we see, you know, we see what's going on. It's the same thing that uh, Louis does with the Cove. Um, to kind of say that you know we are not blind people in the rest of the world are seeing this and, and they feel it's deplorable and um you know so i sort of was looking for these international ambassadors 
uh, to join the Animal Welfare Awards to support animal welfare charities in, in Cyprus to raise and elevate um, their voices and their profile and, and to, to obviously award them for the work that they do and, and simultaneously to say that we care, you know, that Cyprus cares and that um, the rest of the world cares wherever it is in the world about these animal welfare issues and what, how dogs are treated, how cats are treated, how stray animals are treated, um, wild animals. I mean, Alafi itself is, um, Alafi was a type of deer that's now extinct in Cyprus. So that's sort of where the name comes from and the, the logo that you may have seen. And, um, you know, that's, that was the thing. It was, it was, so we, we want to get this out there. And I was like, absolutely. And I think I was one of the first people on board. And I just, you know, I, I say, I, I like to be able to, offer a network to people too you know that's that's a big part of what i was saying earlier that if i don't know the answers i want to call on someone who does so i sort of chatted to anna and, and came up with a few people who may be able to help and um it had this unfortunately again being affected by covid19 in may was the first awards it ended up being virtual because right. everything going on um we had this first awards and, and it was wonderful to see for the first time um appreciation and advocacy of, of welfare, animal welfare, charities, organizations, NGOs, rescues, individuals yeah. in Cyprus and beyond. And, and that was important to me. Um, my my husband is half Cypriot. And um, so that's the heritage of my children. I have two, two young children. And, you know, I, I felt proud to, to be a part of that. So I can sort of say to them that, you know, this is as much in your heritage, what's going on in your heritage, your backgrounds, my, my, my mother-in-law's family, um, you know, I, we reach out, you know, we don't just stop with our own backyards or our own country. We, we keep right. going to that global landscape. And um, yes, yeah, so that was the Alafi. Um, like I say, and they, it was very successful and they're going to have another one next year in May next year. And, and hopefully that will take place in person. And yeah, it's fantastic to see these kind of things. Like I say, my, my personal view is that there is so much room for everyone. You know, the more people who do everything like this, you know, right. Right. do your voice, who share things, who start blogs, who talk, who do um, welfare awards, the more the better. And as many that I can, you know, like you, that I can help along that way or that I can talk to and share their stories to, to my audience, I'll, I'll do that. So I'm very proud to be an ambassador for Alafi and, and great things. And, and I hope that we see this kind of emergence of change in Cyprus I mean, and, and with the Born Free Stance. I know there's a lot of very distressing um, investigations that have gone out on out there mm. in zoos and, and captivity, and that's something that we'd love to see changing too. And I'm sure with the born free hat, that that's an interest of yours too. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I hope that I hope that it does. I hope that by by keep speaking and keep looking and keep our eyes on these things, we can promote that change. Yeah. And you do a hell of a job of that. And another one that we, we in fact, I was going to say you do a great job of it for another uh, organization. We're both ambassadors also for IAPWA, um, International Aid for the Protection and Welfare of Animals, who do incredible work. A, a lot of you guys who follow uh, me on Twitter will have seen a lot of retweets from IAPWA. They do primarily work with dogs, stray dogs in places like Romania, Borneo, the Philippines. Incredible work they do, exemplary. And um, Nikki Stevens, their, their CEO and founder, actually, um, she works on a legislative level. She lobbies governments and she has single handedly, in some cases, changed law alongside the governments of, of, of uh, countries like Borneo. She does incredible work and they're saving lives. And um, so check them out as well. But Kate, how did you get involved with IAPWA? Um, I mean, it's a similar thing, you know, because we're always in these kind of circuits and like you and I, like, you know, you, you go to debates, you go to protests, you go to events, you go to, you know, different places where you get your voice out there. But I, I think I sort of just naturally happened to, to encounter Nikki. And, and of course, there's um, Calls Out, um, part of IAPA, which is um, directly connected to, to lions and the, the trophy hunting and, and canned hunting issues. Which is headed up by, by Beth Jennings. Um, right. you know, so yeah, there was this uh, this Africa wildlife lions thread that goes through my life, um, and like I said, and, and naturally talking to, to Nikki, and she said, you know, do you want to get involved? And at, at that time, being education editor for Na National Geographic Kids, I was able to sort of sponsor one of the they, they did an art competition, I think it was, um, 
photography competition and we're sort of sponsoring with a subscription to Nat Geo and putting that Nat Geo name out there, which is something that I've always loved doing as well is kind of connecting the dots for people, you know, like I said, just having a network, having um, go-to people and organizations that you know, which you get to know so many. I, I love being, you know, sort of creating collaborations and, and bringing people together. So right. things, they all kind of happen quite naturally. Um, and they often evolve and grow and, and become these beautiful, beautiful things. And sometimes, you know, I, I have this honor of sort of connecting people and then having to step back because of my own commitments and kind of leaving that there. And that's that's a wonderful thing to be able to do too. Um, and I have a lot of people reach out to me and sort of say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this. Do you know anyone? You know, I, I want to get, you know, this kind of experience or I'm interested in this kind of career or I'm learning about this or I'm studying right. a degree in this. So I'm, I'm quite good at sort of, building people around to the right place. Um, and, and I'm very inviting of, of that kind of things for myself too. Well, you, you're quite, you're quite good as an understatement. You're very good at a lot of things. And one of, you know, the, I'm just going to put this, the blog on screen again, just, for, just to, before we wrap up, I can never believe how fast these conversations go. We've been on this broadcast for an hour and 20 minutes. Of an it feels like we're just scratching the surface. It's unbelievable how fast the time goes. Um, what you do is incredible and and in, immensely valuable. And before I wrap up and 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 thank you even more, I just want to. I know this is an issue that you'll be aware of, um, which is um, heartbreaking. It's a very very difficult one to talk about, um, and we're going to talk about it next week. Um, in Zimbabwe, baby elephants, are wild caught baby elephants taken uh, from their families by the dozens, uh, by the government or endorsed by the government and sold to Chinese zoos. Um, there's a bit of a theme of unsung hero, I think, today. And one of one, and, and one we're talking to one tonight. And one, another unsung hero, in my view, is. Um, Noma Dubey. Noma is a dear friend of mine and an incredible wildlife campaigner, activist, and the founder of the Zimbabwe Elephant Foundation, whose sole purpose is to tackle this utter atrocity that's happening. And I mean atrocity. I use that word very literally. It's an atrocity. What's happening to the baby elephants and to the families left behind is, 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 is akin to having children stolen from families in you know, in my view, it's that these are incredibly sentient, complex, emotional beings with deep social and family structures. And they're just ripped from their families at the at incredibly young ages in order to be handleable, manageable and easily transported to a life of utter hell in zoos in China, sometimes in shopping malls in zoos in China. You know, it's just it's unthinkable. And Noma will be my guest next Sunday, which is the 19th, I believe. Um, yeah, next Sunday, the 19th at 6 p.m. Noma Dubey, an absolute hero. Um, so please do join me then. And speaking of heroes, Kate on conservation, you, you are a hero. You, you, you what you've demonstrated to me tonight, I'm so happy, so happy and grateful that you've been able to come and share this with with us um because i hope that it's shown you guys watching just how incredible kate is and what and the work that she's done and the the contribution she's made across the board i mean the breadth of it and the depth of it and the the integrity of it that's the that's the key thing is the integrity of it is 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 just exemplary and beautiful and I'm so grateful to you, Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying it's, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, as you well know, it's, it's not never about the compliments well, or the kind of applause. And it's, it's so wonderful to hear such appreciation. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that I expect or, to be honest, I'm, I'm used to and I'm fine about that. And so, but it's really beautiful to hear that. And it means so much, honestly, I'm so grateful. Well, your, your humility shines, shines through just as much as everything else. And it's just, and it's it's really beautiful but um just any final thoughts just anything any final calls to action for folks you obviously they'll come to your blog which i'll share on screen again 
Uh, is there anything that you'd want to direct people to specifically at this point? Um, well, I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm hearing, I, I feel so emotional hearing what you're saying about next Sunday. And obviously I will be able to, to go and, and listen to that. Absolutely. I will be 100% tuning in. Um, things like, you know, when you hear about these these awful things that happen with, with zoos and, and captivity and, and especially animals snatched from the wild in this absolutely abhorrent way, um, it always harks back to me of, of that born free message. And, and that's what I would, you know, if I'm going to call to action anything, I would encourage people to to go out there and, and to, to look up and to, to understand what the Born Free Foundation do because they're working in so many different countries and involved in so many different issues that it really is about that, you know, animals belong in the wild. And the, if they if they have been in these horrible zoo situations, they at least belong in the closest thing to the wild and having the best and happiest life. And to me, Born Free is not just about conservation. It's not just about animal welfare. It's, it's about all both of those things. And it's about a spirit and a philosophy and, and a family and a collective of people that want to, to see an end to that and that will go in and help animals that, that have been subjected to horrible things where they can. Obviously, there's there's limitations, but right. to have that philosophy, to, to at the core of it, remember that in everything that we do, that you do, that I do, that everyone right. does, at the core of it is is this sadness and this, this weight and this heaviness of, of things that animals that are suffering and that we can help those we can help those individuals in, in in whatever way we can is doing something and i would encourage all of that and i would encourage to to, to like I say follow that through with with one donation and and get that that same spirit that that it gave me you know like i said that connection with one free that connection with shamwari that connection as a child with watching that film and, and understanding over time that it's not about cuddling and, and silly lions playing around it's about freedom and it's about wanting that better world and, and I feel absolutely that we are at the end of this lockdown period in the middle midst of all these climate change crisis and, and biodiversity crisis and you know wanting to see the end of, of wildlife markets you know we're in this place that we've never been before which is an absolute melting pot of every one of these issues that I've been following for, for many years and many of us have they've all come into this head now and i feel like now is the time that we as individuals and and as, as citizens of the planet you know we now can set who we want to be and who we are and what we want things to how they want them to be and if part of that is is to see an end to captivity to to, to try and stop things that monetary exploitation that, that drives these um, horrible actions to happen and be it, you know, be the change you want to see. Um, and and that the gift that that gives you back is, is as fantastic as the gift of seeing wonderful things happen. So to so be, be those things, do those things and, and invite that philosophy in is the best thing I can conclude with, to be honest. Well, what an incredible summary and conclusion which nothing i can say will will add to that i think it was brilliantly put it, it, it exemplifies why i think you're so brilliant why everyone should be on the kate on conservation blog and utilize that as a resource for information knowing how solid that information is and how how much integrity it comes to you with kate you're amazing you're a hero thank you we love you and Please um, let us know how, however we can help. You know where we are. Thank you so much for giving us your time. No, it's honestly the pleasure it's mine. Pleasure. Yeah. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're a hero, and um, we thank you. Guys, tune in next Sunday at 6 p.m. Until then, what Kate said. See you soon. <laughs>